theology has not, as a matter of fact, had a very distinguished record in promoting the study of other than the Christian religion. And this is rather puzzling. Most study of comparative religions that goes on in theological schools has historically been missionary oriented to find out the weird ideas of the prospects so as to be able to undermine them. Because you see, if you know in the first place that you have the true religion, there really is no point in studying any other one, and you can very quickly find reasons for showing them to be inferior, because that was a foregone conclusion. They had to be. And therefore, all arguments about the respective merits of various religions, especially where Christianity is involved and often where Judaism is involved and sometimes Islam too, all of which are essentially imperialistic religions. In all such discussions, the judge and the advocate are usually the same person. Because if, for example, you get into discussions as to whether Buddha was a more profound and spiritual character than Jesus Christ, uh, you arrive at your decision on the basis of a scale of values, which is, of course, Christian. And in this sense, the judge and the advocate are the same. And I really do marvel at this Christian imperialism because it prevails even among theological liberals. And it reaches its final absurdity in religionless Christianity, the doctrine that there is no God and Jesus Christ is his only son. Uh, because, you see, there's some anxiety here that even though we don't believe in God anymore, uh, somehow we've still got to be Christians, and obviously because we have a very curious organization which must be understood. The inner meaning of the church, as it works in fact, a society of the saved, you see, necessarily requires outside it a society of the not saved. Because if there is not that contrast, you don't know that you belong to the in-group. And in this way, all social groups with claims to some kind of special status must necessarily create aliens and foreigners. And St. Thomas Aquinas let the cat out of the bag one day when he said that the saints in heaven would occasionally peer over the battlements into hell and praise God for the just punishment visited upon evildoers. Now, as you know, I'm not being very fair and very kind to um, modern theology, but there is this strange persistence of insisting that our group is the best group. And I feel that there is in this something peculiarly uh, irreligious, and furthermore, it exhibits a very strange lack of faith. Because I believe that there is a strong distinction between faith on the one hand and belief on the other. That belief is, as a matter of fact, quite contrary to faith. Because belief is really wishing. It's from the Anglo-Saxon root leaf to wish. And belief, stated, say, in the creed, is a fervent hope that the universe will turn out to be thus and so. And in this sense, therefore, belief precludes the possibility of faith because faith is openness to truth, to reality, whatever it may turn out to be. I want to know the truth. That is the attitude of faith. And therefore, to use ideas about the universe and about God as something to hang on to in the spirit of Rock of Ages cleft for me. You know, hym hymnal imagery is full of rocks. A mighty fortress is our God. Uh, in vain the surge's angry shock, in vain the drifting sand. Unharmed upon the eternal rock, the eternal city stands. And there's something very rigid about a rock. And we are finding our rock getting rather worn out in an age where it becomes more and more obvious that our world is a floating world. It's a world floating in space, 